اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم اما بعد let's begin with a little bit of biography every day we'll do a little bit of biography and then we'll get into topic related to the sahih and reading the hadith you might switch up the orders here and there online students i don't have slides today so don't worry you're not missing anything um so what about the personality of imam al-bukhari we talked about his early life so far um as far as his virtues his personality it's very important to try to get a sense of who these individuals were so we know we mentioned his father his father wrote with his own pen that i have not known a single dirham from my wealth that was unlawful or even doubtful so that's something remarkable about his father that he was very careful and very strict about his wealth and where it was coming from so when you're talking about we're not talking about haram wealth like you know now if you're staying away from clear haram it's considered a virtue back then like if you look at the life of imam nawawi even if he was given a gift like food um he would not accept it because he would it might have been tainted coming from unlawful sources because there was a culture at that time of the rulers bribing people so um there's something to be said about being extra careful or avoiding doubts in your personal matters so his father was like that and imam al-bukhari kind of inherited that piety and, and religiosity so he inherited great wealth from his father and he invested it in property and he paid people well when he employed people to travel employed people to to write on his behalf transcribe he paid them very well so he sacrificed profit in his personal life for honesty and commitment um so that's something amazing like he didn't he taught for free fisabilillah and that's a model we need to revive um is being lost more and more um many of the early greats early experts early muslims it wasn't about money the deen was not a monetary affair they weren't monetizing what they were doing in fact many of the qura of quran the 10 qiraat among them were people who gave money to their students so imam bukhari likewise he taught for free because how was he able to do that because the father was very pious allah blessed him with wealth and then he died at a young age he died when bukhari was at a young age so he inherited wealth so he had wealth and he used it in the disposal of Allah's cause and his teaching. So alhamdulillah, he was, you know, someone who was blessed with not being dependent uh, uh, on employment, not dependent on any of the rulers, which is a great blessing. Um, personally, he had great taqwa. Uh, we mentioned his mother. She was a pious woman and her prayers were answered. He made dua about his blindness. Um, and it was answered and Bukhari himself he says I prayed twice in my life due to a predicament and my prayer was answered then I stopped praying um, he's not talking about salah he's talking about dua that kind of dua he said so twice I made dua and it was answered immediately so he, he said I stopped praying why would he stop praying making dua so he said for fear that my reward become would become diminished because part of the test of life is you ask Allah and Allah doesn't give you right away and you're patient and that patience elevates you and you get a get greater reward in the next life so you know there's a thing look at this perspective of Muhammad Bukhari it's for us when a prayer or dua is not answered is something negative something like we consider oh man what's going on right but Imam al-Bukhari his prayers were answered and he started asking what's going on so he said then I won't go through that process because when you when you make dua to Allah so just sincerely either Allah will give it to you or Allah will give you something better in exchange for that or Allah will hold the reward and give it to you in the next life and all of us praying for wealth praying for Mercedes praying for a good job a beautiful wife imagine on the day of judgment not getting those things on the day of judgment you have something in paradise that's far better 
then you would say at that moment, Allah, give, put me back in, in the world and don't give me, don't answer any of my du'as. So that's what Imam al-Bukhari, so he stopped praying in that way. He, it's not that he stopped making du'a, it meant for his personal needs, he stopped making du'a because of that. Another quality of his is that he lived, uh, he had a great fear of harming or insulting anyone else. He had an intense fear of harming the honor of anyone else. So he lived in a way that he said uh, he didn't want any single human being on the day of judgment to hold anything against him so that they could take his reward. Um, someone asked him, but people critique you in your history work. Uh, the people you critique in your history work, tarikh, um, isn't that backbiting? So, so one of the things about Bukhari is very interesting because you know, <clears throat> the hadith expert, their job is to scrutinize reporters and to take information from the right sources and to point out the wrong sources, point out the narrators that are weak, narrators that are guilty of something, the narrators that are not reliable. How do you do that without falling into backbiting or something negative, or at least falling into, it may be not be backbiting, but something another person might not be pleased with? That's impossible. That's why hadith experts, hadith scholars are known generally, uh, it's a misnomer, but people know them as the harshest people because they're critical of others, critical of reporters. And, but amazingly, Imam al-Bukhari, the more you study uh, his life and his work, it, it's unbelievable. Um, no other human being has that status. He did all of that in a way, he never said anything bad about anyone else. So with his monumental work on hadith, evaluating reporters, and he was the strictest, right? He, his reports, his hadith are the highest tier of sahih. So he was the most careful, and he gave you the best of the reports. But he did that all in a way that he never called someone a liar, never called people fabricators, kathab, very rare. Um, so how do you do something like that without using words like that? Other people didn't. Imam Ahmed called people liars all the time, rightfully so, not that he was lying, but he, there were liars in our tradition. But Imam Bukhari did it with tact, he did it in such a careful way, he never used, he rarely used explicit language like Dajjal or, so he would, if you read his language, it is remarkable how he evaluated reporters, he would use subtle language like this person, people didn't accept him where he is left, matruk, abandoned, things like that. Um, so someone asked him, well, you, because he admitted, he said, haram. He said, from the moment as a child, I learned that backbiting is haram. I have never spoken ill of anyone in my entire life. So someone came to him and said, and also, he also said, inni la arju an Allah." He said, I want to meet Allah without a single person holding something against me that I said something about them. So someone asked him, okay, you're a hadith reporter, a hadith expert, hadith critic, and you wrote a book on transmitters, tarikh. Isn't that fall under backbiting? So he answered to them. He said, everything that I related is narrated from someone, not from my own self. So when he evaluates reporters, like say there's a reporter, he's not reliable or he's known to be lying. What Bukhari will do will quote someone else who called him a liar or said he's accused of lying so that it's not coming out of his own mouth. Every single thing that he uses is based on other experts of his time and before him. That's remarkable. This just shows how careful he was. Uh, Ibn Hajar says this in Huda Sari that Bukhari's disparagement of individuals is so full of mercy and so careful, it's full of careful scrutiny that he often uses terms such as they did not narrate from him or he is disputed um, rather than explicit language like he is a liar, he is a fabricator. At most he would say something like such and such, this person deemed him a liar. So that's unbelievable. So that's something remarkable for someone like Imam al-Bukhari, his status to achieve something like that. He was very pious. All these scholars, they, they lived what they taught. 
So uh, he was very generous towards his students. He spent money on his students. So he would teach for free. Um, and on top of that, he would be the one there helping his students, sponsoring them, and, and even giving money to them for their needs. So how many teachers do you find like that? You know, it's so much we can learn from him. He was a great worshiper. In Ramadan, he would lead his friends in prayer at night. He was known to recite 20 verses in every rakah. He would complete about a third of the Quran in one night. So he would do 13 rakahs, including witr. So three witr, and then how many uh, does that come out to? Uh, eight or 10, right? Um, so he would finish the Quran every three days. That was his habit. Uh, in Ramadan, he would finish one Quran each day. So a third in his tarawih, third during the daytime, and third in the evening time. So one Quran per day, he would finish at iftar time, and he would always finish with du'a. So he would time it that he would finish at iftar. So that's just something about his personal life. Um, moving on to his sahih, just some virtues of the sahih. So just a brief note. Um, he said, Sannaftul jami'a min sittat miyat alf hadith fi sittat ashr sana. He said, I compiled the Jamir, his book, from 600,000 hadith in 16 years. So he wrote a lot. He, uh, his students asked him questions and he dictated personal details. So there's a lot of autobiographical material uh, that we find. So f to learn about Bukhari, you have his own words. So he, you know, so he had uh, 600,000 hadith that he had memorized um, that he knew very well. And from them, he selected for this Sahih, how long did it take him? 16 years, according to his confession. So this book was compiled over 16 years. And that's something, that's a huge amount. For us, it's not a lot because we live in a time we're all lazy. It takes us that long to do anything in our life. But these people died young. All these great scholars died in their 40s and 30s and 50s and achieved so much. So someone like living in a time where every day counts where you achieve so much in a short lifespan, spending 16 years writing means he's put a lot of work into it, a lot of thinking into it. Um, and so we're talking about the virtue, I'm not talking about the academic part of the Sahih, we did that yesterday, just some virtues. So the 16 years is incredible. He also said, ما وضعت في كتاب الصحيح حديثا ما وضعت في كتاب الصحيح حديثا إلا اغتسلت قبل ذلك وصليت ركعتين. He said, every single hadith I put in this sahih, I did not put it until I had purified myself and prayed two rakahs. So that's how careful he was. So it was not just academic, but it was also good link to worship. So how many hadith? 7,000 something hadith we mentioned yesterday. So 7,000 times he made wudu and he prayed two rakahs. And he said, sannaftu kitabi al jami' fil masjid al haram so this is amazing he said i compiled my book in al masjid al haram in makkah so he compiled this book over 16 years he didn't live 16 years it means that he began the outline there and he would often come back and continue working on that so he said I compiled this book in Masjid al-Haram and I didn't put any single hadith in there except that I made istikhara to Allah. So istikhara here, and I prayed two rakahs. And then when I was certain that it needs to be here, that's when I put it in there. So, so does this mean that he didn't do research? It wasn't a historical research or historical investigation that allowed him to reach these conclusions. It was just like dreams and istikhara. No, because we don't understand how istikhara works, how dua works. Dua always works when you make the effort. Like Umar ibn al-Khattab said, like without effort, there's no such thing as it's meaningless to make dua. You can't not do anything for yourself and make, oh Allah, make me rich. It doesn't work like that. Same thing with istikhara. Istikhara is not a dua where Allah gives you the answer and you're guided to something without any effort from your side. Istikhara is where you take your means, you do your best, you do your research, whether it's your spouse, looking for a spouse, a job, looking where to live, buying a house. You do your diligent 
diligence, you do your research, you do your best, and along with that, you invoke Allah, you make this virtual du'a of istikhara, pray to Allah, and then Allah will bless you just to come to the right conclusion and it comes easy to you. So that's what he did. So when you keep that in mind, every single hadith in there belongs there, and it's incredible. He said, I organized the book, titled the chapter between the grave of the Messenger وسلم, and his mimbar, Nani and the Rawda. That's where he did the, remember yesterday we said Fiqh al-Bukhari fi tarajumihi. Bukhari's real genius comes out in the organization of the book, how he divided the chapters and the headings and the names of the chapters. So he said those headings, those names, those chapters, what chapter is next, what comes before, what comes after, and what's the name of the chapter. I did all of that work in the Rawda of Masjid al-Nabawi, and I prayed two rakars after each title. So just here you're learning how his mind operated, how pious he was, what he was doing, uh, rahimahullah ta'ala. And he said, when I completed the Sahih, I presented it to three people. Who were the three people? He said, when I finished the book, I presented it to three teachers. That's another part of his, you know, this is an incredible book. No one did it before him. So he didn't have to present it to anybody, but he presented to Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. He presented his book, to Yahya ibn Ma'in, as a friend of Imam Ahmad. And he presented his book to Ali ibn al-Madini, one of his favorite teachers. These are three great hadith experts of their time. That's where he, he got a lot of his knowledge from. In hadith criticism, hadith expertise, these are the names, uh, among a few others. So he said, when I presented to them, they went through the contents, and they approved of all but four hadith. So the best experts of his time, they said all of this is solid. They only had some issues with four hadith out of like 7,000 or 9,000, depending on how you count. That is incredible. Um, a scholar that investigated like what are those four hadith that they had problems with? He said, I looked at the matter and I believe the truth is probably that Bukhari was right and they were wrong. So that's the conclusion of some other experts. Al-Hakim says, Rahimallahu Muhammad ibn Ismail al-Imam fa'innahu alladhi allaf al-usul wa bayyana al-nas wa bayyana lil-nasi wa kullu man amila ba'dahu fa'innama akhadahu min, uh, minhu ka muslimun. Um, so he said, may Allah have mercy upon Muhammad ibn Ismail. He was a great expert. Uh, what he did, he authored the, the prototype of all hadith books. He clarified that to people, and everyone who did work after him, they took from him, even Muslim, Sahih Muslim. Sahih Muslim was also following the pattern of Imam al-Bukhari. He was a student of Bukhari. And so he authored a book in a slightly different way, but it was the same basic work that Imam al-Bukhari uh, did. Daru Qutni said, Lawla al-Bukhari yu lama raha Muslim wala ja. If it hadn't been for Bukhari, Muslim would not have been able to do anything. So the Muslim would be worthless had it not been for Bukhari, his teacher. Um, and he also said, إِنَّمَا أَخَذَ Muslim كِتَابَ الْبُخَارِي فَعَمِلَ فِيهِ مُسْتَخْرَجًا وَزَادَ فِيهِ أَحَدِيثِ And he said basically what Muslim did, he took Bukhari's work and he reorganized it according to the hadithin and he added some hadith and he took some out. So basically from that you learn that Bukhari Sahih is the prototype. That's the real work of Hadith um, that presented for the Ummah an incredible uh, legacy, an incredible uh, service. And everyone else built upon that. And even that was, as mentioned yesterday, um, was taken to a large portion from the Muwatta of Imam Malik. So all the credit eventually even goes to Imam Malik himself. Rahimahullah ta'ala. Okay, that's all I want to say about that today. Any questions? Yes. Yes, obviously. Whenever we talk about hadith and Bukhari, it's always usul. The idea is, the question was when we say muttafaqun alayhi, uh, agreed upon by Bukhari and Muslim, does it apply only to the primary corpus, to the usul? Yes. But when you look at the 
it's like the footnotes. And so the another a way of looking at the chapter headings and the muallaqat and the hadith that are not in the primary corpus, they're kind of like footnotes. So when you have a book today and you have footnotes, footnotes are not the primary book, right? So you can't really refer to the footnotes. You always refer to the primary. The footnotes are just accessory material. So yes, we're always talking about the primary corpus. Anyone else? Any sisters? Okay. So I want to jump now to a discussion on the manuscripts of the Sahih. Um, that's something I wanted to do on the first day, but it passed, and the second day passed, third class passed. So now I'm just going to force myself to do it because there's so much to cover and a lot of topics get left behind. So, you know, we talked a lot about different versions of Bukhari, Darut Ta'seel edition, and so on and so forth. I have a few copies in front of me in the desk here. Um, and I also gave you. Um, you know, like uh, the first hadith from at least three different um, editions, just to see, you can see the difference of font, so you can decide which one to uh, buy and which one would work for you. Um, so the discussion of manuscripts has to do with a couple of things, and that's important. So, so when, we, when we talk about manuscripts of the Sahih, so the scholarly discussion has to do with the early manuscripts the copy that Bukhari himself wrote. Did Bukhari have an original copy? Did he write a book? Did he write a book or no? Yes or no? Yes. It's not just a memory. I mean, he had it memorized, but he actually wrote a book. So when he dictated Sahih, he had the book in front of him. That's Al-Asl, the original copy. So the, the, the way Hadith dictation sessions would be, the scholar, even Imam Malik, you know, 100 years before him, Malik himself, he had the Mu'atta in written form, and he would teach from that, and then people would come. So what happens in a tradition, in a typical Hadith uh, session, people don't understand that. So you would come to learn Hadith from a teacher, right? And the teacher, rather than teaching from memory all the time, and they have hundreds of students, they're repeating the classes, like, here, I keep repeating the same classes, and so until I develop like a system and I develop my slides and I give out things to students. So these teachers, to make it easier, they would compile their hadith in books. Um, so there's a great article that I translated of Sheikh Akram. Uh, the book is two types. And so that talks about two types of authorship of hadith books in our tradition. So the early hadith books were like Sufyan ibn Uyayna and others. Thousands of students are coming to them. So to make it easier, they would just put all their hadith on paper have a master copy and read from them or have students read from them. What would a student do? How would a student get the book? So the student would come to the session, either have blank pages and write down everything the teacher is reading. So there are two ways in these sessions, either the teacher reads his book or the students read the book to the teacher. That's qira and iqra. That's the two ways of knowledge, right? Sama and qira. It all goes back to the same discussion. So that's the two ways of learning Quran. That's the two ways of learning knowledge and hadith. So, so different regions had their own traditions. So Imam Malik, his tradition was that the students read the Muatta to him and he corrects them. And, and still you find in the Haram today in Medina, the ulama when they're doing the hadith sessions and they're, they're sitting there, the scholar sits there, the student reads the hadith and then he explains the hadith. So that's one way. The other way is like in Kufa, they, they wanted to hear from the mouth of the teacher. So, for instance, Muhammad ibn al-Hasan al-Shaybani, who is uh, the great student of Abu Hanifa, he came to Medina to learn from the Muatta from Imam Malik. So, you would come to Medina. So, what would you do typically? This is how it worked. Either you would go to the shop, the bookstores, and in bookstores you have scribes. That was a profession. Scribes would copy the books of the teachers and write them out and then just put them there for sale. Every single one was original because this is not prior to the printing press. So scribes are copying and then they're selling them, making money off. So the student, one option they had was to go to the bookstore. So you're coming to Medina, you're studying the Muatta with Imam Malik. You would go to the bookshop and buy a copy of the Muatta. But that's never enough. You can never take that and go back. That was never part of the tradition. So the next step is now you come, meet Imam Malik, sit down. 
and you start reading the hadith with him or the join the ongoing session, you open up that copy and you correct the mistake. There's always mistakes because when you copy things by hand, there are always mistakes that happen here and there or an ink uh, stain that makes an extra dot. There's so many examples of that in our manuscripts or something gets erased. So you would copy these hadith and you would check them. And you, once you finished the entire book with Imam Malik or any of the hadith scholar, then you would take that book and you'd have them sign off on it on the end. So the, the author would sign off that such and such a person on this day in this place read these books to me and I've certified that this is an authentic copy of the original. So that's one way you buy it from the bookstore. The other way is you write them yourself. You sit there and you write the hadith as the teacher is transcribing yourself. So you have your own copy. You're not trusting anyone else to write for you. And, and then you're learning and so on and so forth. A third way is some people employed scribes. They had bad handwriting, so they had good scribes. Like Imam al-Bukhari had a scribe. His name was Muhammad ibn Abi Hatim al-Warraq. So you, your scribe will be with you or your servant. And you're sitting there and you're having him write in the presence of the teacher. And then you add your notes and so on and so forth. Um, so that's the different ways you would receive a book. So you had an original copy that was in the hands of the author, the teacher. Then you have students that come to create their own copies, transcribe from the original copy, have signatures, and then take them away and then start teaching them their lens. And then other students did the same. So that's how books were passed down. So Muhammad ibn Hassan coming back to him, his approach was different. From where he came, they learned from teachers. But he came to Medina, I was like, no, 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 I can't do this. I need to hear the hadith from Imam Malik himself. So he forced Imam Malik or requested Imam Malik that I am, I'm only going to write down the hadith that you read. So Imam Malik wasn't doing that, so he did that occasionally. Because of that, he spent three years in Medina rather than a couple of months like most people did. So Muhammad ibn al-Hassan has a version of the Muatta that's very valuable. It's called Muatta Muhammad. So it's very, very valuable because he wrote those hadith down after Imam Malik read them. So all those hadith, he only wrote them down when he was reading them too. So that makes it very different from the other versions of the Muatta. And then he also added some comments of his own, uh, you know, because he's from the Hanafi school, from the Kufan school. And the Medina, there's a huge rivalry. They look down on the, so Imam Malik would make jokes about the Kufans. And then when he would see Muhammad ibn Hassan sitting there, then he would correct himself. So that's, what do you learn from that? You learn from that, we need to learn, we need to meet each other. People will come from different traditions. When you're in your own bubbles, in your own masajid, you get more and more extreme. And you say things about other people that are outlandish. And the other people don't really say that because you never sat with them. But if you are sitting there and there are people of the other side sitting in your audience, you would be more careful with your words. So that's, that's a good thing. And early Islam, it was like that. People learn from each other. And there was a lot of that Imam Malik learned from Muhammad ibn Hassan. And so many Kufan students came from the other side. And Imam Malik, by the end of his <clears throat> 40 years, whatever time he spent writing the Muatta, he had learned so much of the Hadith from the other regions as well. So that healthy interaction debate was happening in these circles. Muhammad ibn Hassan, and he's very accurate, he's a scholar. He would write down, like Imam Malik said this, and we as Kufans don't agree because we have this evidence. On some point he would write down, you know what, the Medinans are right. Their evidence is stronger than ours. So there's a lot of good stuff happening there. That's his. And he wrote Kitab al Hujja ala Ahl al Medina. That's a separate book where he really went into the debates between people of Medina and the people of Iraq. Where he kind of defended his school, but so it's it's in a respectful way, and he also uh, ceded points to the other side. So, so coming back to the Sahih al Bukhari today, so ignorant people will say, "Where's the original? We don't have the hadith written down 300 times, years after the Prophet, and then even Bukhari, we don't have the original." That's one of the silliest things. Where's the original of the Iliad of Homer? Of like what, 4,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago? There is no original. Where's the original of many of these authors that you read? Because paper doesn't survive the test of time. But all these books were taught continuously uh, in every generation, transcribed until they reached us today. So we can be very certain that what we have of the Sahih al-Bukhari today is the original, is close to the original, because there's a whole historical process here. So anyway, 
what are the great versions of the Sahih? Because when you have thousands of students, each one has his own version of the Sahih and teaching in different regions, eventually what happens is differences begin to emerge. So there are differences in the different versions of the Muatta we find today. There are differences between in some of the different uh, versions of Sahih al-Bukhari we have today. Minor differences. We saw one yesterday. What was the difference we saw yesterday? Exactly. There's a word, فَيُفْسَمُعَنِّي And he leaves me. فَيَفْسِمُعَنِّي And he leaves me. Or يُفْسَمُعَنِّي And left from me. Talking about revelation, how it comes down. It's past tense, present tense. Just a difference of يُفْسَمُ يَفْسِمُ the meaning is the same. So these things happen. So that's, these are the kind of differences we're talking about. We're not talking about huge clashes and conflicts and so that people exaggerate. Um, so they're natural differences that happen in any book. So, so coming back to <clears throat> the Sahil Bukhari, the original, um, what are the best versions from the early time? So Sahil Bukhari, so over time, so I told you the process, right? Students would come transcribe the Sahih from Imam Bukhari's original work, then take it back and bring it to um, different regions. So over time, there was a need felt to create a more authoritative edition or a manuscript, an asl, that people could rely on um, instead of just individual students. So there were these group efforts that happened in our history. So there are three great group efforts that I want to highlight of the Sahih. And they're very relevant to us today because every book of Sahih you have today goes back to one of those. So the first great group effort um, happened with Abu Dhar al Harawi, a great scholar from Afghanistan, who lived 100 years after Bukhari. Abu Dhar al Harawi. He died in the year 434. <clears throat> so only 100 years after Imam al Bukhari. Abu Dhar al Harawi, he had three teachers that taught him Sahih Bukhari Al Mustamli, Al Kushmihani, and other, and a third one, I forget the name. These three teachers were students of Farabri, who was the last student of Bukhari. So, Bukhari's greatest student uh, was Al Farabri, because he read the uh, Sahih Bukhari from Imam al Bukhari three times, and he was the last student to meet him before his death. So uh, most of the versions of Bukhari go through Al-Farabri. So Farabri students were <clears throat> Mustamli and Kushmihani. So Farabri, you need to know him. And then his student Mustamli. So Mustamli says that when I learned the Sahih from Farabri, Farabri had the original in his hand. The original. Original of Imam al-Bukhari himself, that he took directly from the copy of Imam al-Bukhari, transcribed, exactly. So, Mustamli had the original, and that's what he learned from um, Farabri. Now, Abu Dhar, who we're talking about, so he was a student of Mustamli. So, how many generations from Bukhari? So, you have Bukhari, Farabri, Mustamli, Abu Dhar. Abu Dhar and Bukhari, only two links between them. So this is a very early project. It's just two teachers between them. So what he wanted to do, this is what he found that the teachers that he was learning Bukhari from had some differences. So he wanted to compile all the variations of the three teachers that he learned from into one manuscript. So it was a lower scale project, but it still was a great project. So what he did is um, he put them together and um, where there are differences, he would note, okay, this word is different here, this word is different here. So he was the first one in the history of Sahih Bukhari, like the history of the text, to compile and make like a, a greater project to try to resolve some of these differences. So Abu Dhar al Harawi, his manuscript was lost, but then he taught to others and others after them. So, um, so what I have on this, desk here. This is the entire Sahih Bukhari. That's a manuscript from Abu Dhar al Harawi that was recently discovered lying in a library in Istanbul in the Sulaymaniyah Mosque. So one of our teachers, Mujir al Khatib, uh, Hafizahullah. Uh, so there's a lot of, there's an exodus of Syrian scholars and scholars from Egypt and all around the world living in Istanbul. 
So there's a revival of learning happening there. So there's so many treasures hidden in these libraries that um, are just waiting to be discovered. People just don't know about them. So he discovered this manuscript. He reached out to the authorities and the president, Rajab Tayyip Erdogan, he sponsored this project. So they took a picture of every single page, the original picture of the page, and they published it. And they published a separate volume introducing what this project was. This is a great discovery. It's one of the earliest manuscripts of Sayyid Bukhari in Iran, and that we have in a library. And now they publish it for everyone to see. So, George, you go over there. I want to pass this around. Um, I'm actually to uh, of Abu Dhar al Harum. And sure. it's in a modern font that you can read. But if you're interested in manuscripts, this is what it looks like. So it's not that hard to read, but it's you need to get accustomed to. So this is available for purchase. There's production written by uh, there's some history of the text as well. So for people who are online, this is what it looks like. Um, it's an entire leather binding. So if you want to see what an original manuscript looks like, it's a picture of the original manuscript, of course. So it's available. We got it for about 300 liras. How much did you pay for it? Um, I bought it like three years ago, three years ago. So it's, it's not expensive, but it's something amazing. So I'll pass it around so you guys can take a look at it. Um, so you can see that we have very early manuscripts that are still in libraries today. Um, I, was re I was looking up the library of Princeton University here. Princeton University has a manuscript section where they have tens of thousands of Arabic manuscripts in, from the Muslim world. And I mentioned, I think I mentioned in this session or maybe another class. Um, was it this class when I talked about Ibn al-Jazari? Yeah. So there's a, there's a copy of Ibn al-Jazari's Tayyibat al-Nashr lying in Princeton Library that has Ibn al-Jazari's ink on it. He signed it at the end. It's original ink. And that's from 600 years ago. Not as early as Bukhari, but still Ibn al-Jazari. So, so they have more than 20, maybe two dozen manuscripts of Sahih Bukhari in Princeton University Library. Some of them are a couple of pages. There's, page, there's volumes missing. Some of them are larger works. And some of them are 500 years old. Some of them are 200 years old. So we do have a lot of manuscripts um, from the earlier times. So it's a myth to say that these books have not been preserved and that um, you know we don't have the originals and they were lost and so on and so forth. But we don't need those originals. That's the point. There's an obsession in Western academia with originals and manuscripts. Muslims don't need that. Do you need the original Mus'haf? You know the Quran. You're going to memorize it when you're a child. The Quran doesn't need original manuscript. It's meaningless to us. It's just interesting. It's nice. I don't get all this obsession Muslims have when they have like an old version of the Quran. Oh, wow, it's so beautiful. The Quran is in your heart. It's the same Quran. Those original pages are not meaning, that meaningful for us. Because it's not about the object. It's not about that. It's about the content. So Sahih Bukhari was memorized. And it was taught generation to generation continuously without any interruption. So what we have today, we have Sahih Bukhari, we know what he wrote. So these silly arguments that the book was lost and we don't even, how do you even know Imam Bukhari wrote it and so on and so forth. It's, it, doesn't, it doesn't really fly. So that's the first great project. And I think with that, should I do the other projects? Okay, let me do the other projects. So. This is Abu Dhar's edition. So the other great monumental project happened by a man by the name of Sharfuddin Al-Yunini. So you just memorize or just know Al-Yunini, Al-Yunini. Al-Yunini died in the year 701. So now we're going further in time. In the year, uh, he died in the year 701. So in the 600s of the Hijri calendar, Yunin, he was from, it's a town in uh, Baalabek, which is present day Lebanon. So Al Yunini, he was a teacher of Ibn Taymiyyah. And he was a teacher of Imam al Dhahabi. And he was a teacher of Al Birzali. 
great historians and great scholars. And he was a student of, so his three students were Ibn Taymiyyah, Al-Zahabi, and Al-Birzali. And his two teachers, Ibn Al-Salah, Al, you know, Al-Muqaddimah, Muqaddimat Ibn Al-Salah, that's a great reference on Hadith. He was a great Hadith expert. And Al-Munziri, Al-Munziri wrote at targhib wa Tarheeb. It's a really popular Hadith book in the Indian subcontinent. So, so Yunini was a great, Having students like that and teachers like that, you know he's somebody. So what he did in the year 666 of the Hijri calendar, um, he did a monumental task. He convened a scholarly assembly in the city of Damascus in the year 666. And the purpose was to bring all these manuscripts of Sahih Bukhari around the world and produce like one authoritative one. Kind of like, you know, well, why are people doing this? It's kind of like what Uthman did trying to just standardize something so it makes it easier for everyone. So what they did is he chose some of the best scholars um, and they had, they had debates and they had sessions. How many sessions did they have in total? 71 sessions. So over 71 sessions, they had a whole group of great scholars and they hired the best calligraphers. So Ibn Zaid was a great calligrapher he was hired to do the writing. And they had, they hired, or they brought on board, one of the best grammarian of their time was Ibn Malik. Ibn Malik died in the year 672 from Andalus. He's a great grammarian, he has books. So they utilize him to just look at the grammar from a grammar perspective. So they had some of the best experts. What they did is they chose five of the best manuscripts of Sahih that were in existence, and they chose Abdul Ghani al Maqdisi, another great scholar, his manuscript as the mother text. And then the differences in the other manuscript they would put in the footnotes. So they use a number of manuscripts and, um, and then they used also, um, so they use Abu Dhar, this, this manuscript of Abu Dhar that is going around. That was one of the ones that they looked at and they compiled an authoritative copy. And the main copy that they relied on was a copy written by a woman, Karima al marwaziyah who died in the year 463. She was a Muslim, Muslimah who lived to 100 years old. She was a teacher of Khatib al-Baghdadi. So she was amazing because she lived such a long life. So many people came and learned from her. Um, so she had a copy that was very highly accurate of Sahih Bukhari. So that's the one they kind of relied upon for this project. Um, so then they made countless copies of this project. So what is this project called, this, this version? It would be called a Yunini manuscript. So countless secondary Yunini copies were compiled and spread throughout the Muslim world. When was this written? 666. The primary original itself was used to transcribe original copies and spread throughout the world. The original itself was given to the Mamluk official, uh, Alauddin. He kept it at his madrasa in Cairo. Um, and many scholars come and use that. So Al-Qastalani, who wrote a Sharh of Sahih Bukhari, like 200 years later, he came to Cairo and he took the original and used that to write his commentary. So that original was there for hundreds of years. Um, then eventually, Hundreds of years later, in the year 1100, now we're coming closer to our time, there was a Meccan Hadith expert, Abdullah ibn Salim al-Basri. So he spent 20 years traveling the world. He collected manuscripts. He took the original, so it became passed on into his hands. So that original was in his hands. Um, Shah Wadiullah, now this is a story of the Sahih al-Jamr Sahih in India. Shah Wadiullah, he came to Abdullah ibn Salim al-Basri, uh, or he used his copy uh, of the Yunini manuscript. And he um, took that manuscript, added his own notes, brought it back to India. And in India, his son, Abdul Aziz, put some more notes on it. And after him, Muhammad Ishaq, and after him, Nadir Hussein al-Dahlawi. So this manuscript stayed in India for quite some time. Um, Ahmad Ali borrowed the manuscript from Nadir Hussain, but then, you know, um, when a lot of people start working on something, then it gets messed up. 
then they start making mistakes and then uh, then also gets lost. So this manuscript was passed on to Abdul Aziz, then Nadir Hussein. Um, and then it's probably sitting somewhere in a library in, in the world or possibly lost. So now that brings us to the final great project. That was a Unini project, year 666. The great project is, and this is the one we use today, um, the best, if you ask any Hadith expert, what's the best um, edition of Sahih Bukhari? They will say the Sultaniya edition, the, the royal edition, or Amiriya edition. So when did that happen? In the 1800s. So in 1893, that's in our grandparents' generation. The last Ottoman Sultan, the last great Ottoman Sultan, Abdul Hamid II. So he issued an imperial degree, decree to Cairo, the publishing house, Al Matbal Amiriya, and he wanted to produce a new edition of Sahih Bukhari based on those, a meticulously evaluated edition looking at everything out there. So they used a range of invaluable manuscripts, including the original Uninia they got from the Imperial Library of Istanbul, and um, which was sent actually uh, from Cairo to Istanbul. So they used that and they produced an authoritative copy with the Committee of 16 Scholars from Azhar University uh, under the auspices of the Grand Sheikh of Azhar, Hassuna Nawawi. Um, and then they all reviewed the work, everyone, like when you have a group project, there's a lot of work that goes in there. And then what happens is, after they finish the project, this Unini, okay, the Unini I mentioned is, uh, we don't know where it is, so it was, Abdul Hamid had it, the, the original Unini uh, manuscript. After they compiled their own edition, then they sent the Unini back to Cairo, and then it got lost. It's a great mystery. No one knows where it is today, that original Uninia. But they produced this one in the 1800s, the uh, Nuskha Sultania, the Royal Manuscript Edition. So this was critically edited by a scholar from Medina, uh, Zuhair Nasser, I think, I believe that's the one one of you have. And it was published uh, in Medina, and that's the one most people rely on. And in modern times, they take that and they just change the font and they you know, produce new editions. But all of these editions go back to either Abu Dhar al Harawi, goes back to Yunini, or Abdul Hamid Sultaniya edition. So when you read any Sahih Bukhari, you look in the front, it'll tell you what is uh, it based upon, what, it, what did they use. So this royal manuscript, the original, is in Istanbul. So this is from the 1800s, so it will still be around. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. That's all I have to say about the manuscript. This is a very deep topic. Um, it requires a lot of expertise. I'm certainly not an expert on that. Um, there are a lot of good resources now. A lot of people are writing and doing good work on the manuscripts. Um, there's a brother that runs the website Hadith Notes. Uh, he's a solid scar. Zaman is the last name. I forget his first name. Muntasir Zaman. Uh, no. Is that his name? Muntasir. Yeah. So he's writing a lot of solid books and he's looking at this as his interest, the manuscripts and stuff like that. So there's a lot of good articles on his website that you can read for further information. Allahu A'lam. We'll take a few quick questions and then we'll break from Maghrib. Arshad Bayi. Still kept alive that 
and you spend time with them. The other option is if you are local, they go work. Yeah, because I was looking at the video yesterday when you guys talk, we don't hear a single thing because we have mics here, unless you use that. So I repeat it from the beginning? <laughs> no, <laughs> that's okay. So the other option is if you're local, the sheikh actually reads for the class, or they actually have a dedicated the the, the qadik, He's be reading the hadith and the sheikh explains it. So these two mm -hmm. methods, obviously nobody's writing manuscripts, but mm -hmm. and so those are still I know it's preserved, uh, but you the, the sheikh has to be close to because you cannot just go to a random person and say sheikh, give me your time. They be like, <laughs> yes, subhanallah. I mean, so today, what is what does that process look like today? So today, because printing press era, things have changed. You have to get get with the times. Now we live in the era of the printing press. Now, now the discussion has to be which version, which publishing house are we going to use? Darul Salam, Darul Fikr, or um, you know some of the other one, Darul Taasil. So these are publishing houses that publish in mass scale. So and among the publishing houses now, there's discussion which ones are good, which ones are horribly, notoriously unreliable. And everyone knows these. So today the discussions are different, but still there's a there's still that value of sitting with the teacher has not gone away. That's still there. So still when you have a book, you have to sit with the teacher, read, you learn so much. And even with these best publishing houses, there are still mistakes. Now the mistakes are computer mistakes. Transcribe not like hand mistakes in the past. They're computer generated mistakes or mistakes from the printing press where like the the machine malfunctions and there's like a dot missing or something missing so there are a lot of mistakes that happen so you have to be aware of that uh, there's never any substitute for person-to-person -person learning so in fiqh circles the books are available but you you said for ijazah so the ijazah kind of got modified now now ijazah is just your proof of a personal connection with the teacher so you got ijazah in the book means you read this book from a teacher you know and even that is abused a lot, so a lot of people get a jazz and never read it, or they're reading and they're sleeping in class, like a couple of you in the back. So they're, they're a jazz of circles. I travel a lot. I was into it at a while. At some point, there are people sleeping in these classes, and they're getting their certificates and their jazz. So that happened, and probably happened back then, too. Allahu alam. Okay, you, you want to pass that over? <laughs> Whatever happened to the four hadith that were critiqued by the Imam? So that, that represented a difference of opinion. They're in the Sahih. The Imam Bukhari held on to them like his opinion was they're okay. So what are those? It's interesting to figure out what those four were. I would, but there, it's not just those four. Daru Qutni has a lot that he criticized. Other scholars looked at certain hadith that is not strong. So it's actually more than four that people have criticized. but. At the end of the day, this is scholarly research, so it's up to you to, like, there's nothing wrong with criticizing a hadith in Sahih Bukhari, but you just have to bring your evidences and your research, and people have done that, but a lot of people have defended him and said, well, they're probably not right. Dara Qutni, in all his critique, he wrote a huge book critiquing a lot of hadith in Sahih Bukhari, he's wrong on most counts. Some of them, you might be able to give him a point, you know what, he might be right, but Bukhari had a different perspective in mind. And at the end of the day, these are experts, scholarly opinions of the best experts, and there's going to be differences. You know, Allah Anyone else? Okay, let's take a break, 15 minutes for online students, and we'll be back. Uh, we'll continue. The rest of the session, we'll be reading the hadith, inshallah. Okay, Bismillah. I'm just going to sh uh, show some uh, some things from these books that we have. So, so some of the brothers have very good manuscripts here. So the one I mentioned, the Sultania edition, I I mentioned that it was published by a Medinan scholar. So this is it right here. So the Sultania, the royal edition, was published by. Uh, and so, how would you recognize it? So, if you look at the uh, tracking mode, one second. Here is overhead whiteboard. 
tracking. Okay. Okay. So this particular edition, so very nice, beautiful binding. So if you open up the title page or look at here, let's read it together. You can't see that I read it to you. So it says um, Sahih al Imam al Bukhari. That's what it says first. The Sahih of Imam al Bukhari. Then al Musamma, the title, has a whole title Jami al Musnad al Sahih al Muhtasar min Umuri Rasulillahi wa Sunani wa Ayyamihi. The Imam and the name of the author. And then it says the Sharrafa bi Khidmatihi wa la Inaya to bihi Muhammad Zuhair ibn Nasir. Um, so he was a Medinan scholar. At the turn of the century, he published many books. So he took that Sultani edition and used a modern printing press to publish it. So, so this is the most authoritative one that's been used for the last hundred years. So, and if you look at it, it'll say, so it says on the, in the cover, um, somewhere. On the first page, it'll tell you the Sultania edition and, and um, some information about it. So if you look at it, this is the way it was published. Um, it's, it's written in a, in, a, in a font that's not too bad. It was uh, about 100 years ago they used this font, the printing presses. It separated really well with color, Bab and Hadathana. And it has footnotes on the side. Those are the authoritative footnotes of the work that they did with the Sultani edition. They'll tell you this word is read in Abu Dhar's manuscript in a different way and they'll tell you on the side. So this is what Shaykh Akram uses. This is what most of the Muhaddithin, this is the version they use. So this is published, so the publisher is Darul Minhaj. Darul Minhaj. So Darul Minhaj is the publisher, it's a famous publisher. Uh, they're supposed to publish Sheikh uh, Akram's Sahih Muslim Commentary, which is finishing in the next couple of weeks. So this is the Sultani edition. Now, here's a different one, a second one. So now this one has an entirely different font. It goes by columns. You have two columns. So it's just a different font. What version is it? It's the same thing. Sultania. So it all says, uh, it says somewhere, Tabar Jadida. Munaqtaha bi muqablat ala nusqa al sultaniya. So it's based on Sultan, uh, Sultaniya edition. So all these different editions you have from different publishers is still Sultaniya. They're taking the Sultaniya work, just publishing in their own font. But the one that was done originally by the Medinan scholar is that one. So this is a modern version of that from another publisher. The publisher here is Arisala, Darul Risala. So this is another version, still Sultaniya. And then Brother Ibrahim has this one. Uh, this is the one that I use. This is the one that I use. I have a different version of the same. This is published in Turkey. It's a Turkish print. But if you look at the first page, it will say Nusqa uh, Sultania. So the same thing. This is also Nusqa Sultania. So all of them are that. But here, they eliminated all the footnotes, side notes. They just made it easy to read. So. Almost all the ones out there are based on the Nusqa Sultania. So if you look at the first page, it'll tell you basically um, who is the editor on the bottom, like uh, the publisher, and then what version is based off of. Um, if it's not a good publisher, then they won't do that. Like a lot of good publishers, they won't give this essential information. So, you know, that is hugely important. And then, the other versions, like Abu Dhar, is not Sultania. That's a much earlier version. And turn this off. And that's recently published. And then people, what they're doing, they're taking these recent editions uh, or the recently discovered manuscripts and republishing them in these modern printing houses. So Abu Dhar's copy I showed you, this is the original copy, uh, one of the original manuscripts from very early on. Now, you, the, so what were the three projects I mentioned? Abu Dhar al Harawi, and the latest one was Sultania. What was the middle project? Uninia, okay? So Uninia was the first major project, So and even the Sultania was based on that. What about the Uninia itself? So 
there's actually recently the Uninia version has been republished by a printing house. So I downloaded all the volumes. Let me open up my drive. Maybe I can show you on the screen. Okay, I don't need this one. So this edition looks really nice. Um, and it looks like it's published really well. So people are doing all sorts of things. In Morocco, they're publishing according to their style and their Maghribi font. Everyone's doing their own thing, adding their own um, thing to it. So, no, no, not yet. I'm looking for it. What is going on here? Okay, the share screen is messing me up. Any questions while I look for the manuscript? Any questions online? Hadithnotes.org. Jazakallah khair. Yeah, he's he's a he's a young guy, but he's very deep. Um, he's doing some solid work. Zaman, yeah, he, he published a book, The Height of Adam, recently published. Yeah, so why is can't find my windows? Okay, so open up your Sahih Bukhari and um, we'll have someone read and I have to stop, actually I have to stop sharing or I can do extension because I need to see my notes too. Okay, so and I'll, I'll have to throw this to that window, there you go. There you go. Okay. Who's going to read? Maybe a sister today? My wife told me that you never look at the sisters, never call on the sisters. Anybody want to read? Yes or no? So this hadith is a little long. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. So we're going to read this hadith. So let's read it step by step. Okay, stop there. So, okay, now you can, um, we're going to talk about the Isnad first, like the Isnad is hugely important. So there's a lot to unpack and talk about here with the Isnad. So the Isnad, I wrote it on the board, hopefully it's correct, I did it from memory. So Hadathana, who's the teacher? Yahya ibn Bukair. So that's the first, um, uh, that's an R, not an L. So Yahya ibn Bukair, Qala Hadathana, who's next? Layth ibn Sa'ad. An, who's next? Bukair. An, ibn Shihab. An Ibn Shihab, Ibn Shihab al Zuhri. And then An Urwa Ibn Zubair, Urwa Ibn Zubair. An Aisha ta Umm al Mu'minin, Annaha Qalat, Awaluma. So whose words are these? Awaluma Budi Abihi Rasulullah. Yeah, look at your text. So these are the words of Aisha. So this is a hadith of Aisha, radiallahu anha. So now, we can spend an hour on this isnad, but it's really important because these are first few hadith we really need to know. So when you start reading these isnads, like I said yesterday, this is history. 
You need to look at them as real individuals, look at the history, let the history come out. So Isnas don't make sense just in, in an atomistic way, you look at each name. I could give you the biography, Yahya, Layth, Uqayl, but we need to see the connections, okay? So on my board, I have the Isnad tree, and you have the hadith in front of you. Um, so I'm not seeing the Unini edition, but if you see a difference, like because the screen's behind me, if there's something in significant difference from what, different from what we're reading, just someone pointed out to me. So let's look at, okay, the tracker. Okay, let me have that microphone back. This is the Unini or Abu Dhar's copy for the system you guys, uh, if you girls want to look at it. Okay, so first, let's look at, let's look at it in pairs. So when you look at it, it's not, you need to highlight certain major individuals. Obviously, the companion is important, but now we're studying it's not. So here, Laith ibn Sa'ad and Zuhri, huge. And then you can analyze the rest of them in relation to that. So let's look at pair by pair. So I want to talk about Yahya, Laith, this pair. Yahya ibn Buqayr is a teacher of Imam al-Bukhari. He relates from Laith ibn Sa'ad. So Yahya is a student of Laith ibn Sa'ad. He's a great Imam. So I'm going to start with Laith ibn Sa'ad, tell you about him, and then Yahya and why Bukhari chose this combination. What was he doing? What was he trying to do? So, let me start with Laith ibn Sa'ad. Laith ibn Sa'ad died in the year 175. So 175. He was a great Imam and jurist from where? Anyone know where he was from? Very good, Egypt. Laith ibn Sa'ad was someone who was a contemporary of Imam Malik. They were friends, they lived in the same time, they had the same teachers, many of the same teachers. So he was a great person of fiqh as well. He was from Egypt. He lived a very long life. Imam Shafari considered him to be more learned in fiqh than Imam Malik. Imam Shafari famously said, Al-Laythu afqahu min Malik. So he was someone who was Probably in Shafari's estimation, he was a better teacher, better scholar than Malik, but he had worse students than Malik. Because of that, his school of fiqh died out. So it didn't survive. So Laith ibn Sa'ad had his own opinions and views and he had his own methodology in a school of fiqh. But it's one of those that didn't survive. Imam Malik, being from Medina, he had prestige, the location helped, and he had huge students. So that's, that's another thing that like often when someone's popular, it's yes, it's tawfiq of Allah, but also it's due to factors like, you know, just like riwayat hafs in Quran, we all say riwayat hafs is the best. That's what we all recite. It's not the best. It's just because the Ottoman Empire ruled the world and the printing press was published and uh, the first recording devices came into play. The Ottomans were in charge and they're Hanafi. And, you know, Imam Asim was teacher of Abu Hanifa. So that's what they happened to recite. So they chose the Hafs reading and became popular. The first published Mus'haf, Masahif were in Hafs, first recordings on radio were in Hafs, and the whole world started reading Hafs. It wasn't like that in Morocco. It wasn't like that in North Africa. And even today, there's parts of North Africa, they're only reciting in Wash. They don't know how to recite Hafs. So it, it's just, there's historical factors at play. Anyway, Laith ibn Sa'ad was a great scholar, a great expert. Um, he and Malik disagreed quite a lot. They have some famous written exchanges. There's his famous letters there. Malik wrote to Laith and Laith wrote back and there's some amazing lessons there on points of disagreement. There's so much we can learn from that. Um, they disagreed a lot, extensively on fiqh. But in their disagreement, there's still a lot of adab. They're making du'a for each other. You read the letters, it's amazing. Um, I wish we had so much time, like we could just have a side digress and have a side class, just read those letters in Arabic and English, learn Arabic and learn some things. 
Anyway, um, Leith ibn Sa'ad, um, so one of his students, his, his, his best student was Yahya ibn Bukair. So Yahya ibn Bukair. So now let me focus on Yahya for a bit and I'll come back. So Yahya ibn Bukair was a senior hadith expert of Egypt. His full name was Abu Zakaria Yahya ibn Abdullah ibn Bukair. So he's known as Yahya ibn Bukair for short. He died in 231. So he was a student of Imam Malik and a student of Layth ibn Sa'd, both teachers. As a student of Malik, he wasn't so strong. As a student of Layth, he was much better. So about him, so he was a teacher of Bukhari, Yahya ibn Ma'in, many others. Uh, Nasai said about Yahya ibn Bukair, he's a weak narrator. Okay. Abu Hatim says, La yuhtajju bihi, he's not relied upon. Um, but then in another place he says, Kana yafhamu hadha sha'an yuktabu hadithu. He understood hadith, so you can write his hadith. So the a judgment of Yahya ibn Bukair is kind of ambivalent. So some people consider him weak. Bukhari and Muslim considered him reliable, uh, generally speaking. Dhabi said the following, Qult, kana ghazir al-ilmi arifan bil hadithi wa ayyam nas basiran bil fatwa sadiqan dayinan. So he says he was someone, he praised him, of great knowledge and so on and so forth. But then he said, Imam al-Dhabi, wa ma adri ma laha li nisa'i minhu hatta da'afahu wa qala marra laysa bi thiqa. And he said, I don't understand how someone like nisa'i was an otherwise great expert, deemed him to be weak. So Dhabi did not agree with the weak rating. Um, so Yahya ibn Buqayr read the Muwatta with Imam Malik 17 times. So Yahya ibn Buqayr is disputed, right? A lot of experts took him and they considered him strong. Some of them did not. So at the very least, you can say he's not the strongest reporter. He's not undisputed. So the question is, why did Bukhari pick a reporter that some people considered weak? So if you don't understand the matter, the essence of the issue, then you know it could lead you to believe, well, Bukhari wasn't as great as people think, or he made a mistake here. There are some weak reports in Bukhari. If he is unanimously weak, this hadith is weak. That's how it works. If there's a weak reporter, the hadith is weak. Like if he's unanimously weak. But Here's what I hope to impart to you, like Bukhari, for Bukhari and the Hadith experts, it's not just a matter of names. It's not just a list of names. For many contemporary Hadith experts, for them it's just names. Okay, Yahya, weak, the Hadith is weak. So you just read the biography of each person, he's thiqa or he's da'if or what, and then you rule judgment on the Hadith. Bukhari and these individuals were so deep they were investigating, even if the reporter is weak, he didn't want to eliminate the narration. He wanted to see, well, maybe the report is still strong. So they looked at it in more investigative detail. They had more nuance. So Yahya ibn Bukhayr is from Egypt. Where is Layth from? Egypt. So Yahya learned the Muatta 17 times from Malik. And I told you, Imam al-Bukhari, he relates all the hadith from the Muatta. So if there's a hadith on a chapter from the Muatta, he always begins with that. So that's his preference. So for him, that's a solid book. Um, but in the Sahih, he has zero hadith from Yahya from Malik. Because Yahya was not a strong student of Malik. But he has a frequent Isnad Yahya from Layth. They're two rivals. Layth is from, Adi uh, from Egypt, Malik is from Medina. And in the exchange, you can realize why, you know, uh, Malik privileged Medina and fiqh. And Layth pushed back against that. Well, you know, anyway, Yahya is a student of both. But Bukhari never took his hadith from Malik. He agreed that he's a weak reporter. But he took his hadith from Layth. Why do you think that is? What is, you know? There is what? got to meet him more. That could be one factor. So the clue is Yahya, he's a student. Uh, he's from uh, he's from Egypt. Layth is from Egypt. He spent his lifetime under that teacher. So Bukhari is not just looking for someone who got Ijaz or, or a Hadith from a teacher. He's trying for every Isnad looking at the top students of each teacher. 
So it's like, you know, you have a great scholar today, right? And they have hundreds of students. You could pick a Joe Schmo that sat in that scholar's class and just get something like about that teacher. Or you could look for a student that spent 20 years with that teacher and lived with him, knows him inside out. There's no, there's a huge difference between that person and that person, even though they both studied under the same person. So Yahya ibn Bukayr, although he, he's a compromised reporter, the matter is more nuanced. Bukhari in his selective research, he realizes as a reporter from Laith, he's solid because he is Hadith scholar, spent so much time with from Laith ibn Sa'ad. So for him, this is not this solid. But Yahya from Malik is not, and there's not a single example of Imam, uh, Imam al-Bukhari relating hadith of the Muatta through Yahya from Malik. Although there are many hadith that he, he narrates the whole Muatta from Malik. And he is a teacher of Bukhari. So Bukhari could have narrated many of the hadith of the Muatta through Yahya from Laith, uh, or Yahya from Malik rather, but he didn't. So that tells you the matter is much more nuanced. It requires more skill. Um, so sometimes a person could be weak in a certain topic, but strong in another topic. Well, sometimes a reporter could be strong from one teacher and weak from another teacher. So this is not the solid. That's the conclusion because Bukhari was digging deep. They're both from Egypt. So this pair, we learned that the remarkable point that Bukhari, he was looking for the best students of every teacher. So Yahya may be weak in general, but from Laith, he's very strong. Okay, so Bukhari is not just looking for any person from like students of different people. So that's one issue that, that we learn. Um, so Bukhari generally preferred the students of the teacher that are from the same region. Why? Because they spend the most time with the teacher. That's one important principle in Bukhari's methodology. And that's something amazing. Like if you want to learn about such and such a scholar, you go to the people from his land, the students from his land, people, students spend time with him. These are the things people miss when they just look at a list of names, it's just an isnad, oh, he's weak. My judgment is the hadith is weak. So yeah, he could be weak, but from Laith, he's the strongest student of Laith. So this is not the solid. That's the first issue. So Laith ibn Sa'ad, Yahya ibn Bukair, okay? Now, Laith ibn Sa'ad, um, I mentioned, so he's a contemporary of Malik. They have the same teachers. Who's the famous teacher of Malik? Who's the next person on this scale that we need to look at? Who's the famous teacher of Malik I always reference? Like majority of hadith in the Muatta come from two teachers, Hisham ibn Urwa and the second one. Who's that famous teacher of Malik that said so many things? Now, this teacher, you know, Malik is um, learned 30 hadith from this teacher. And Malik asked him to repeat 15. He forgot half of them. And this teacher said to him, Ya Malik, my entire life, I never asked a single teacher to repeat a word to me. And repeating, asking a teacher to repeat something to me is more harder to me than moving a mountain. Because this teacher was solid. He's one of the best experts of hadith, remarkable memory. Um, he was someone who narrated from memory among the people who didn't use books. And he was... Malik's best teacher. Who is that person? Huh? Zuhri, yeah. So Ibn Shihab al Zuhri. So Ibn Shihab al Zuhri. So let me tell you a little bit about him. Now I'm jumping to Zuhri. So Yahya ibn Bukair, I told you about him, died in the year um, 231. Laith ibn Sa'd died in the year 175. I'm going to go come to Aqail, but first Zuhri. So Ibn Shihab al-Zuhri, they say the most prolific narrator of hadith among the Sahaba is who? Abu Huraira, yes. So the equivalent of Abu Huraira among the Tabi'een is Ibn Shihab al-Zuhri. Zuhri is the most prolific narrator of hadith among the Tabi'een. So he's from the later generation of the Tabi'een. So he met companions. He's not a, from the early part of the Tabi'een. He's from the Sigar of Tabirin. So he's the most prolific narrator of hadith among the Tabirin. You cannot study hadith without seeing Zuhri's name. So he's one of the six pillars of hadith. We mentioned in Hadith 101, in the third class or fourth class, there are six people 
They're called Madar al Hadith. And all of Hadith, or the vast majority of Hadith, go through these six individuals. They're all from the Tabirin, from the junior generation of the Tabirin. So among them is Ibn Shihab al Zuhri of Medina. Among them are Amr bin Dinar of Mecca. Among them are Qatada of Basra and others. Um, but anyway, Ibn Shihab al Zuhri is one of the pillars of Hadith from the Tabirin, most prolific narrator of Hadith. Um, Sufyan ibn Uryayna, one of his students, Sufyan ibn Uryayna from the Hadith of Rahmah. He said the Hadith experts of Hijaz are Ibn Shihab, Yahya ibn Sarid al Ansari, and Ibn Juraj. So he was someone absolutely incredible, amazing. Um, he had great memory. He always taught from memory. Um, he never um, taught from books. Uh, Hisham ibn Abd Malik, the ruler, once asked Zuhri to dictate hadith to his son. So he dictated 400 hadith to the son of the ruler. After one year, Hisham wanted to test him. And so after a year, he met him. He said, you know what? Can you repeat those hadith, those 400 hadith? And then, so and he was testing him. He had the book, but he didn't show him the book. So he says, um, he, well, he... Is a white lie. He says, "Qala li Zuhri an nazarik al kitabu da'a, fa da'a bi kitab fa amlaha alay." So he brought a new book and he said, "Can you give me those four hundred hadith again you narrated last year?" So he um, wrote them all down in a new book. Then they compared that to the book that they had from last year, and he said, "Thum qabla bil kitab al awwal, fa ma ghadara harfan wahidan." There was not a single letter that was different. So that's a memory of Imam al Zuhri. Zuhri was someone amazing. Um, he was, you know, someone, one of the things about him also, someone asked Saad bin Ibrahim, a contemporary of Zuhri, Bima faqakakum al Zuhri. Why is Zuhri so much ahead of you? Zuhri is so famous. You were in the same classes. So the son asked his father, Saad bin Ibrahim, how? So he said, this is why. Then this is great, like um, teaching about the adab of knowledge and what makes what makes one student excel above the rest. So he says, Zuhri in our classes, He said he would come in the classrooms from the front, and he would always sit in the front and never in the back. So that's one great factor of his. He was so keen on knowledge that he always sat in the front. Um, and then in every majlis, he says, this is, these are the skills and qualities of Zuhri that made him who he was, the, the best teacher, favorite teacher of Imam Malik, the source of most of the hadith, the muatta, and so on and so forth. And then they said, وَلَا يُبْقِي فِي الْمَجْلِسِ شَابًا إِلَّا سَأَلَهُ وَلَا كَهْلًا إِلَّا سَأَلَهُ وَلَا فَتًا إِلَّا سَأَلَهُ so he says in every class after the teacher goes away, he's not running out of class. He says every class after the teacher goes away, he would start discussing with the students. He wouldn't leave a single person, young and old, in the class except he's discussing the class. So he was inquisitive. He was really into knowledge. So that's a second quality of his. And then, And after that, not only that, not only in the classroom, he learned outside the classroom. What did he do? He would knock on doors and go to every house of the people of the Ansar. Where is he? In Medina. He's from Medina. So he's knocking on door to door on the houses of the Ansar and just to ask them questions. He said, he didn't leave any house behind. Young, old, even to the point he didn't leave women behind. He would talk to the women. And his shyness did not prevent. He even talked to women, older women, and he said, even the young virgin females who are shy and hidden behind the tents, he would still talk to them. That's how keen he was on knowledge. These are the qualities that made him who he was. He was inquisitive. He was learning in the classroom, outside of the classroom. He had this solid memory, and he was always keen on learning. So he was uh, Imam Malik's favorite teacher. Imam Malik says uh, something interesting. Uh, he says, there are so many old men in Medina I'm not learning from, but this young man in Medina, I learned from him. 
Imam Zuhri. So Imam Zuhri was older than Malik and he was pretty old. But one thing about him, he used to, hair, he used to dye his hair black and his beard black. So he's one of the scholars, there were many early scholars that died totally black. Um, so he would deceive people. Imam Malik thought he was a young man and he sat and still learned from him. But generally his style was not to learn from young people. So he was a teacher, Zuhri was a teacher of Abu Hanifa. He was a teacher of Imam Malik, the teacher of Sufyan ibn Uyayna and many, many others. So anyway, that's Imam Zuhri. He's a pillar of Hadith. So we're always going to see many Isnad with Zuhri. He died in the year 124 of Medina. Now, now we're talking about the pair. So Zuhri was a teacher of Imam Malik and Layth ibn Sa'd. So Layth ibn Sa'd learned from Zuhri. So now, but here you don't have Layth ibn Sa'd narrating from Zuhri directly. In Imam Muslim you do. Layth from Zuhri. In others, other books you do. So what's going on here? Remember I said Bukhari is looking at the best students of every teacher. So for Zuhri, who's better as a teacher, as a student of Zuhri, Malik or Layth ibn Sa'd? Malik. Why is where's Zuhri from? Where's Malik from? Zuhri's from Medina, Malik's from Medina. So Layth ibn Sa'd is from Egypt. So, and you know, he's not known to be the best student of Zuhri, but he is a student of Zuhri. Um, so there are better students. So Bukhari is always looking for the best at every level of the Isnad. That's the point. Other hadith books, they're not going for that level of detail, that strenuousness, that, you know, so they're just looking for any okay. Layth, he did narrate from Zuhri, but Bukhari, that's not a good enough. Says, no, Zuhri, I want the best teacher. So, you know, um, so that's a huge lesson here. Um, Bukhari takes the hadith from every narrator from their top tier students, not their second tier students. So the students of every narrator, they're divided into top tier, the best students, and the lower tier. So Layth is a great Imam. Imam Bukhari does accept him. He has his nod from him. But Layth from uh, Zuhri is not that strong. So Layth from Zuhri is not that strong. From Zuhri, so this is about Zuhri. Imam Ibn Hajar does some analysis. He says Zuhri has the, his best students. There are five, the top tier students. And Bukhari only takes from them. All the hadith of Zuhri, which is the bulk of hadith. So Bukhari is taking from Zuhri students. Who's one student? Malik. So he accepts Malik as a student. Another student he accepts Sufyan ibn Uyayna. Another student he accepts Shu'aib. Another student he accepts Yunus ibn Yazid. And number five, Uqail. So these five individuals are the top students of Zuhri. So although he had hundreds of students. So Bukhari, when he's looking at hadith of Zuhri, he's only taking from these top five. So Uqail is one of them. But Layth, although he narrates the same hadith, Bukhari doesn't take him. If he did take Layth from Zuhri, it would make the hadith much higher. And that was something amazing. Like having one less link is something amazing. But Bukhari privileged authenticity and this methodology of his, going for the top tier students. Okay? So now, Uqail, let me finish with Uqail. So Uqail died in the year 144. So he was from Medina as well. Um, he was from Medina, he eventually settled in Sham and then in Egypt, he's all the experts. Uh, we don't know much about him. He died in the year 144. All six experts of Hadith accept his Hadith and he deemed, he's deemed thiqab or trustworthy by everyone. And he's one of the top tier students of Zuhri. So his full name is Uqail ibn Khalid ibn Aqil, Abu Khalid al-Umawi Mawlahum. He's Umawi by clientage. So anyway, that's Uqail. So that completes our Isnad. Urwa ibn Zubayr, we looked at Aisha, we looked at yesterday. So what do we learn from here? We learned so many things that, you know, um, scholars are not just looking at names. Bukhari and Muslim, they're not just looking at names, they're looking at much more than that, who are the best of each. Now, um, So why do, we, why do they do that? You might make an argument, well, Zuhri, 
His hadith are well known. Why can't you take hadith from a lesser known student of Zuhri? Sometimes you can do that, right? Zuhri is an expert. He has hadith are well known. Actually, Zuhri, despite his stature, he did have some problems. And what's the problem? Zuhri is solid as an expert of hadith. Now we're getting into a level of critique and detail that is really deep. Zuhri, he never lied. But what Zuhri would do, sometimes he was relaxed. Uh, and sometimes add his own explanations narrating hadith. So because of that, even Imam Malik, as his student, as his favorite teacher, he wasn't happy with that. So Zuhri had a lot of idrajat. Idraj is insertions. So Zuhri's hadith, because he was a teacher, he's adding a lot of explanations. So when you look at Zuhri's hadith, there's that element there. There Sometimes there are conflicting reports. Sometimes there's information coming from himself. And the hadith we were talking about is similar to that. I'll talk about that maybe next session. But so Laith in his famous exchange with Malik, that's a beautiful letter. So Laith wrote to Malik that, وَكَانَ يَكُونُ مِنْ إِبْنِ So Laith is responding to Malik. Malik is, is tearing Laith apart for his fiqh opinion, so a lot of his fiqh views, based on what they do in Medina. And he's saying, this is what we do in Medina. So Laith writes back to Malik, he says, you know, yeah, you're right, Medina is this and this and that. But from day one in Medina, the Tabirin were disagreeing with each other and even the companions. So he's pushing back a little bit. And he mentions Ibn Shihab. So Laith says, وَكَانَ يَكُونُ مِنْ Ibn Shihab اِخْتِلَافٌ كَثِيرٌ إِذَا لَقِيْنَاهُ When we meet Ibn Shihab, we find so many differences whenever we meet him. وَإِذَا كَاتَبَهُ بَعْضُنَا فَرُبَّمَا كَتَبَ إِلَيْهِ فِي الشَّيْءِ الْوَاحِدَ لَفَضْلِ رَأْيِهِ وَعَلْمِهِ he says, despite his great knowledge and stature, if someone asks him something, he might say something, relate something, but he might answer, And sometimes he gives students contradictory details and they're contradicting each other. So Laith, he didn't like that, so he left many of the narrations of Zuhri because of that. So Malik, he writes back, he says, look, I was there in the classes with you, I agree with you, we both didn't like these extra things that are in the class, but I select what's important and what's authentic. So even Malik is doing the same thing Bukhari is doing, he's being selective. So you don't eliminate everything from the teacher. You take the good from the teacher and what you're solidly certain about, and you leave those things that you believe he's not that strong in. That's another great lesson here, that you don't, it's not take it all or leave it all, right? It's uh, so, you know, there's this ambivalence about Zuhri and his idrajat. So even Muslim and others, they knew that. So they would say, Qala Zuhri in his book, prefacing many of these extra insertions. So Malik, when he wrote back, he said, look, you were with me learning from Zuhri. You were as upset as I was about some of his reports, but we selected the good ones from them. So Malik knew the problems with the Zuhri's report, so he wouldn't take all of them, but he would take the ones that he was certain of because they were doing that research, that diligence. So that's the whole point here in these isnads. If you just look at a list of names, you won't know all of this information. So you can't just say Zuhri is solid, everything is solid. You can't just say Laith is solid, everything is solid. Or Yahya is weak, everything of his is weak. You really have to dig in deep, look at these relationships, look at these pairs, look what the students and teachers are doing. So Bukhari in general, conclusion is, his methodology is looking at the top narrators of each student. So for him, top narrators of Laith are certain individuals like Yahya bin Bukair and like uh, others like Qutayba. And that's what he's looking at. He has top narrators of Imam Malik. He has top narrators of Zuhri. Even Malik and Sufyan ibn Uyayna, they're both students of Zuhri. Malik is stronger from Zuhri than Sufyan ibn Uyayna. So Malik was more careful. He did more research and he moved scrutiny of reports. So in general, so if you have a hadith of Zuhri, coming from Sufyan from Zuhri, and another one coming from Malik from Zuhri, and it contradicts, Bukhari always takes the one from Malik from Zuhri. For him, Malik is stronger than Sufyan. Although Sufyan is strong as well, but it's just, if there's a clash, you have to go with the stronger one. So this science is very deep. It requires so much like skill and so much expertise. So when people reduce it just to a list of names, strong, weak, and just like tick marks, checking off strong, weak, and then so there's a lot of scholars that do that. Their scholarship is shoddy or weak. Um, 
and they don't understand the sign. They don't understand what Bukhari was doing. And if you misunderstand that, somebody could say, well, Yahya is deemed weak. Bukhari has a weak hadith in his book, and they'll use this as an example, not knowing that nuance. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. I think I'll stop here on the isnad so we can move on and finish the hadith. Any questions on the isnad? Yeah, go ahead. I know, uh, maybe something. Uh, so, I, so let's say you're going to do sujood. This is a big. Uh, I'll just make it a bit. So sometimes when you check on the research on this topic, uh, they they mention this to either to put your hands first to do sujood or you put your feet first. And the ones who say put the feet first is always that the riway is taqwa, even though they don't deny the fact that the other one is a sahih narration. But they always say. I would prefer acting upon a riwayah that is more stronger than preferring a riwayah that is more, let's say, not on the same level. So would that be the same comparison as you're saying? Between, uh... Yeah, of course. Like, like, so we're going to be faced in with like a lot of differences and you have to make a decision somehow. What is the methodology you use to make a decision about which way to go or what to expect or what to accept? So there are vastly different approaches in fiqh is slightly different. Um, one approach is look at the strongest evidence. So that's that's approach of like Ahl al-Hadith and early Muhaddithin, like Bukhari. Bukhari wasn't bound by a, a, a school of fiqh, but he was looking at evidences, and his whole Sahih al-Bukhari project is an evidence-based religion project. That's really what it is. But there's another approach there where you look at the schools of fiqh, and that is also an approach uh, um, and that approach is, well, we believe these schools have already done the research. So then their approach there would be not looking at the evidence which is aqwa, but they look at in this school, which is the more mu'tamad or relied upon position of the Hanbali school, of the Hanafi school. of the. So that's a vastly different approach that bypasses the Hadith discussion because they believe you can't have those discussions because they were already done. So obviously there's problems with both sides here. I mean, not like if you look at the work of Bukhari, do you think every contemporary Bukhari understood what he was doing? And many of these experts of the fiqh, of fiqh, they weren't familiar with this. So like a lot of the views probably were based upon, you know, evidence that wasn't that strong or evidence that was strong. And then also, do you accept weaker hadith? So for many people, they accept weaker reports. If you accept, if you open up your repertoire, to even the Hassan and weaker hadith, then your opinions will change because there's much more you can choose from. So it's 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 very complicated, is nuance. But this is Bukhari class. We want to appreciate Bukhari's methodology. And if you like that methodology, that's a perfectly valid methodology. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. That's evidence-based methodology. It's looking at the evidences. It's not to say that you and me, all of us can we have the skills to evaluate the evidences, but that methodology and approach, we can adopt that in our life. I'm a strong believer in that. So like looking at the strongest evidences, it is a valid approach. No one can deride you otherwise. Yes. Was Bukhari's methodology just for... Hands or knees, yeah. So that, I mean, I haven't studied that issue. I'm not gonna, so when you go down to Sajda, you bring your hands down first or the knees down first. So there's two opposite conflicting reports and scholars on both sides of the issue. Yes. Um, did Bukhari's methodology bleed into his other reports? Or was it just for specifically for his Sahih? So he had a uniform methodology for all his books. Like so he has he has specific views that he believes in. Um, and he followed the evidence everywhere. But um, so we talked about this, I think, week one, so you can watch those recordings. So his Sahih al-Bukhad, the al jami or Sahih, had a specific purpose in mind. That was to relate the most strongest, authentic narrations. So for there, his criteria the highest. He wanted to produce evidences that are undisputed. No one can uh, question. His other works, his bar is a little bit lower. So he has the same methodology, but the bar is a little bit lower. It's not low enough to include weak reports but acceptable, like the realm of acceptability. So in his books on like Adab al-Mufrad, the bar is lower. So he includes many reports there that are, could be 
second tier Sahih or Hassan. Um, he didn't purposely include any weak or fabricated narrations, but there could be in the second body of work, like some reports that are deemed to be weak, and there are. And he wasn't bringing that scrutiny to that table. But th those aren't his real work, so we need to appreciate Bukhari, his legacy as Jami or Sahih, not all the other books. The other books are secondary books, and um, they might have been altered at an earlier phase in his life, too. That's also an issue someone needs to look at. Wallahu alam. Yes. Did the students of Zuhri try to pay special attention to the additions he made, and did they ever remove them or just call them out more explicitly? Yeah. So that's why there's so many differences. If you look at the students of Zuhri, so Zuhri's hadith are studied a lot in hadith science, so they're called Zuhriyat, even as a name for it, because he's such a prolific narrator, they're called Zuhriyat. And also there are a lot of hadith he narrates, Balagani, it has reached me that such and such, so without a clear it's not. So that's Balagat of Zuhri. A lot of research done on that. So from his students, there are many conflicts between his reports. What does that mean? That means the students weren't just memorizing everything, otherwise they would be the same reports. But they're scrutinizing and they're like, you know, selecting from his report. So there's a selection taking place. So Ibn Hajar's analysis is, and, and Bukhari, based on Bukhari's research, that these are the five top students of, of so Ibn Hajar even goes to, Ibn Hajar outlines five tiers of Zohri students. So the top tier students for Ibn Hajar are Yunus, Uqail, Malik, Sufyan, and Shu'ayb. And these are the, the ones Bukhari goes for. Then he has second tier students. They're less reliable, but they're fairly accurate. They're the ones that didn't accompany him for so long. These are people like Layth ibn Sa'ad, al awzai another great Imam, Abdurrahman ibn Khalid, ibn Abi Dhi. So these are second tier students of Zuhri. Bukhari generally avoids them for the primary corpus, but he uses, sometimes uses them from Zuhri in his Mu'allaqat or his secondary reports. Then you have third tier students that are less reliable from Zuhri. These are all students of Zuhri. And uh, um, Ibn Hajar lists, and they're not well-known names, Jafar Ibn Barqan, Sufyan Ibn Hussein, Ishaq Ibn Yahya Al-Kalbi. Then you have fourth year students, fourth tier students rather, Zama' Ibn Salih, Muawiyah Ibn Yahya Al-Sadafi, Muthanna Ibn Al-Sabah. Then fifth tier students, Abdul Qudus ibn Habib al Hakam ibn Abdullah, Muhammad ibn Sa'id al Maslub. So these are very weak students. So the students are divided into these tiers. So that's what these scholars were doing, looking at the more reliable ones, the less reliable ones, and even ranking them. So then that's how you evaluate reports. So you go for the top tier students, they are going to be much more accurate because they can record things accurately and they also have knowledge of their own. They can push back and scrutinize information. And they can be selective, take the strong reports and leave the ones they believe are weak based on their own scholarship. So that's what's going on. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we'll, I'll give you an example. We'll see the next line when we read the hadith, there's a Idraj of Zuhri. So because, but so that's not a negative thing. Idra just means I'm explaining things to you. I'm just bringing up points that come to my mind. I'm adding things. I'm just not, I'm not just reading a book to you, but everyone adds things. When you teach hadith, this, these are real sessions. You're interacting, you're adding things. Um, so students who are writing, sometimes they're not careful and they'll, Zohri's own comments, they'll add them to the hadith. Um, sometimes they wanna add them, but sometimes they do it inadvertently. So idraj is a huge uh, topic. We looked at that in Hadith 102, the mudrajat or idraj. Um, but I'll show you what it looks like. Um, it's, it's in the first line of the Hadith, actually. So can we read the Hadith? OK. Um, where's the microphone? Let me have the microphone back. Anyone else want to read? Any other sister ones? It's a long hadith. It's been like two or three lines each. Um, just read a little bit more and then we can read. 
So read after this, Nad. Qalat from there. No, call it, say call it so we know who's speaking. So actually, you know, let me open my Bismillah. So when you reread a session after a long, prolonged thing like that, you want to uh, situate everyone. So the best way to go back so then it's much more clear for everyone. Okay. okay, that's it. So that's the first line. So, so who has a translation? So, on the authority of Aisha radiallahu anha, she said, The first thing that began, uh, so someone also look up the translation, we can see um, what the official translations are. So, she's speaking about the beginning of Revelation. So, first thing here, this is a hadith of Aisha. She's speaking about Revelation. So, it's not the Prophet speaking, but it's still a hadith because we're speaking about Wahi to the Prophet. So, so this hadith proves the greatness of Aisha radiallahu anha. Her reports are highly critical, they're highly detailed, they're excellently summarized, extremely valuable. She was a teacher par excellence. So it's not just she's relating information, memorizing and passing it on. She's digesting their information, putting together in the best way. So that's why the hadith of Aisha is so valuable in every subject matter. She has the best accounts on many issue, things, most detailed accounts. So if you look at just the Arabic, how long is it? This hadith goes to full page. In this particular, goes most of this page and half of the next page. This is her account of the beginning of Revelation. So it's not just a rote memorization. It's, it shows her deep understanding. She was the wife of the Prophet Sallallahu She was there toward the latter part of his uh, Nubuwa. And she's and she's speaking about the beginning of Revelation. We went to Ghari Hara. Was she there at that time? No. So she learned from the Prophet ﷺ, and these companions they were summarizing and teaching us such beautiful ways. So they're not always first-hand witnesses. She was first-hand witness in some portions, but most of this she's not a first-hand witness. But she learned it from the Prophet ﷺ, and it's it's fine. So she says the first thing that began. Uh, with the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Ar-Ru'ya As-Saliha True dreams, truthful dreams Fin Naomi in during his sleep Fakana la yara ru'yan illa ja'at mithla falak al-subh He would see dreams and then they would come true like the breaking of the dawn So this is the first stage of Prophet So now this hadith is describing the beginning of Revelation So this hadith is related to the chapter in the strongest way so the first two hadith are building up to that, and they're also related. There is a reason they're there. But this is now describing the beginning of revelation to the Prophet. So it's sort of No, because oh, well, the Ru'ya Saliha phase is in Mecca before Iqra came down. That's prior to But she wasn't there, right? So But I mean she's saying what she knew of him. Or, or yeah, what she knew, of course. Yeah. She, where did she get that information? From him, obviously. Yeah, yeah, directly from the Prophet. The Prophet would tell her or what happened. Him, yeah, him. yeah. And she would ask the Prophet questions. She lived in his house. So when Aisha tells us something about the Prophet, it's solid. We don't need to investigate where did she get it from. Like, you know, if my wife tells you something about me, you're not going to say, who told you? She lives with me, right? That's why I keep her away from the public because like, I don't want my stuff exposed. But with Aisha from the household, like there's, it's solid, like, you know, you don't need to get into the details. So, and she's not bothering with where I got this information, was I there or not, or things like that, because she's part of the household. So she knows everything. She's asking him, interacting with him. Everything she's asking him is indeed recorded, but this is a great summary and, for Bukhari is solid, 
for all of us a solid summary of what revelation looks like. So the first stage was truthful dreams. There was a period, a preparatory period, where the messenger was seeing these visions and seeing um, what was going to happen during the day. He would see it at night. And then like the break of dawn, like the night turns into day, things become more clear. Whatever he saw began to happen. Ram al writes uh, or reports in an author that this period lasted for six months. So, you know, there's a teaching that dreams are 146th of prophethood. So, so that's what this is speaking about. And so Sheikh Hakram said this, this, this teaching is only for the prophets, it's not for us. So a lot of people are into dreams, they'll say, well, dreams are 146 of prophet, and they use that for their own shuyukh or their, you know, saints and so on and so forth. So this hadith, this hadith is misunderstood. So Yaakov says this is for the anbiya, ru'ya saliha, not others. You can have dreams, they can be truthful sometimes, but they're not that truthful dream of prophethood. That's part of prophethood. What's the wisdom of these true dreams? To prepare the prophet for the wonders and the intensity of revelation that's going to come. It makes that ultimate eventual experience more bearable. Because everything needs prep, right? Prophet and his whole life was preparation. Just like the story of Musa, you read his life. At every phase of his life, Allah is preparing him for the next stage. That's what life is. So, um, Salabi in his book on the on Sirah, he says, the Prophet would experience wonderful dreams, awaken in a state of bliss, and witness those things in real life. So that was the first stage. And then continue. Keep going. Okay, that's it. Ila ahli is a complete thought. So the second phase. Thumma hubbiba ilayhi al-khala'u. What's khala? Isolation. So the second phase, something happened in the personality of the Prophet where he began to um, love being alone. Uh, Al-khala. He used to begin, this social isolation began endeared to him. So he would spend days on end. And where he would go, his favorite place was Ghari Hira. So he had this restlessness. You can see that Allah is preparing him these truthful dreams and the Prophet. At this point, he knows Allah, he knows his Rabb. So it's not like he's totally, like, you know, has no faith. And then revelation comes and he becomes a believer. He knows the Rabb. He knows Rububiyya. He knows he has to worship. He knows idol worship is wrong. He knows all of these things. With his pure nature, how could he not? So, but he was hungry and he was thirsty. He was restless. He came to a stage of his life. He needed answers, so he started withdrawing because the answers were around him. So, so, ثم حبب إليه الخلاء وكان يخلو بغار حراء فيتحنث فيه. So he used to go to the cave of Hira, and he used to يتحنث فيه. So يتحنث is a strange word; it's hard to understand. It's not a very common word in Arabic. So here, when you read the hadith, what does it say next? وهو التعبد. And that is worship. And that means worship. So he used to retreat to the cave and do hanath, and that is worship. So where does that come from? So Ibn Hajjah said, this is Zuhri. So that's Zuhri speaking right there. There are some that believe that Aisha said those words. Yeah, he's explaining, yeah. So, so you can tell when you read Arabic, wahua ta'abud seems like a parenthetical comment. Like a, in English, we put dash, and we would say, and that means worship, and then continue with the sentence. So this is an example, wahua ta'abud is the idraj of Zuhri. So it's a good idraj, it's just an innocent idraj. It's not something that affects the hadith or changes anything, of course. Yet the hanath is not common, so you have to explain it. Wahua ta'abud, okay? And then, al-layali dhawatil adad, many, many nights at a time. So we don't know how long he would spend each time, but sometimes longer than others, it would be days to even one month. That's how long he would spend in Ghari Hira. And then, uh, 
دور حرا و یعنی و و تعبو لات ناس قبل این قبل این ینزع الى اهله before so you spend days there at a time before ينزع الى اهله what is ينزع الى اهله mean return to his family okay so that's one explanation what does the translation say so Shaykh Akram makes a point that that misses the point Yanzir is not return something much deeper desire yeah Yanzir means long for so you know it's uh if you look up Lane's lexicon the last name Nazar it says long for to a uh, yearn for something to long for something not just go back go back is a innocent neutral word so you know what do you need there there the, even the prophet وسلم, he was close to khadija he needed his family so this social isolation wasn't an abandonment of the family he needed some time and he would spend time there until eventually that need would come back he would felt this feel this longing to come back home that's something much more beautiful so he would come back home uh, to his beloved wife khadija radiyallahu anha qabla an yanzi'a ila ahlihi so that's that teaches much it's it's much deeper than yarjiro because it doesn't say yarjiro ibn hajar kind of misses his point he said yanzir wa huwa yarjiro it means to return but it's much much deeper um so my yarjiro ila ahlihi wa yatazawwadu bi mithli hadha another narration but so then the next thing wa yatazawwadu li dhalik and he would prepare tazawwadu means to prepare izad right izad is your provisions so Zad is when you go to a journey, you get ready, you pack, the packing. So yeah, like uh, you get everything ready, your luggage and things like that. So he would prepare for these trips. He wouldn't just go, just run away. It was preparation and it was always coming back home. It was like this controlled way of doing it. So he would prepare, meaning he would bring food. And when it would run out, even Khadija would come and climb the Ghari Khara, bring him food until he was ready to come home. So. This was something, um, something really, really important. فَيَتَزَوَّدُ لِذَلِكَ ثُمَّ يَرْجِعُ إِلَى خَدِيجَ فَيَتَزَوَّدُ لِمِثْلِهَا Then he would come back to Khadija and then he would prepare again for the next time he wanted to go. So this process continued for almost six months before revelation came. Almost six months this was happening. So this social retreat, what's the implications of that? So that's kind of misunderstood. So... You know, there are many things in the seerah or in Islam that were relevant once and not fully relevant anymore, but in a modified way. Example would be like hijrah. You can never have hijrah again. Like the full hijrah where the entire community has to migrate for the sake of Allah and the messenger. If you don't, you're a hypocrite, you don't have iman. That's not going to happen anymore. Why? Because there's a hadith, la hijrah ba'd al-fatih. It's over. You can't be muhajirin anymore. But that doesn't mean there aren't lesser forms of hijrah that's still applicable in our lives. Same thing like this, a social retreat is not a thing anymore. So it's not something that Muslims are required to do. It's not part of Islam. You have to retreat and go away. But in this way, but the notion of retreat is still part of Islam in various forms and manifestations. So Ibn Hajar makes that point. And so what are like, manifestations of retreat, social isolation retreat in Islam, what are some things that close? I'tikaf. So now we have I'tikaf in Ramadan. You get away from your family and you just isolate yourself. You have Salah. Isn't Salah like a retreat? When you pray, you cut yourself off from the environment. Now you could, yeah, Sakanun Lakum. It's a comfort for you. Also, Hijrah is a form of social isolation too, in, in the form that you know, you're leaving hijra, you can leave sin, you can leave um, one land for another, um, going out for jihad in the path of Allah, going for a project. All these are forms of social retreat, but we don't have it in this form where Muslims are obligated to go and spend days in a cave. So this is just, it was exclusive to the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What's next? Okay, sister, go on. Keep going. Akhadani. 
ثم أرسلني فقال اقرأ قلت ما أنا بقارئ فأخذني فغطني فغط فغطني الثانية حتى بلا مني جهد ثم أرسلني ثم أرسلني فقال اقرأ فقلت ما أنا بقارئ فأخذني فغطني الثالثة ثم أرسلني فقال اقرأ باسم ربك الذي خلق خلق الإنسان من علق Keep going. Okay, so I have Iqra wa Rabbuk al-Akram. You don't have that? Okay, so yeah, so see there's a difference in some manuscripts. We have a little more of the verse and others have a little less of the verse. What are your, is there a footnote on that? You have that and there's no footnote or anything? What about on the screen here? Is there a footnote? No, oh, you need to go to the next page? Okay. Okay, so... Okay, that's just a reference of the verse. Okay, so that's not a big deal. Like, what happened? Oh, well, yeah, that is angle. Okay. So... What does it say? Hatta ja'a al until the truth came to him while he was in Ghari Hira. So the angel came to him and said, Read. He said, Ma ana biqari. So then he uh, said, He grasped me, faghattani. So he choked me, squeezed me, hatta balagha minni al jahd, until it was overbearing for me, I could not breathe. And then this process happened three times. Every time he said, Read. And he said, Ma ana biqari. Uh, I do not read or cannot read. And then it happened three times. And the third time he released me, Arsalani Fakala, and he said, Iqra, read, recite um, in the name of your Lord who created the Surah Al Alaq. Iqra wa Rabbuk al Akram. Farajar biha Rasulullah. Okay. So this is the first revelation. Okay. First revelation, um, I cannot read. So, so you know, this is, everyone knows this, You're, you learned this as a child, this incident. Um, so there's significance here that like, what's the first revelation? And so the significance that we give it is like, is misunderstood. Like, so we love standing in interfaith in front of non say. Islam values knowledge, the first verse revealed was read, and you're standing in a school and you think it means to read mathematics and geography and history and political science. That is so silly. So that is not what this verse is talking about at all. And that is not, it's not, it doesn't, it was the first revelation is not, oh, human beings start reading books, right? There were no books at that time and none of these fields were there. What do you mean? Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khala. So if you look at what that means and what the next verses were revealed, what's the first thing that the Prophet did? And what's the first thing that he was obligated to do? What's the first thing Jibreel taught him next? What was all that? What's the first thing? Huh? Ending? Yeah, yeah, warn, but no, before the warning, warning came much later. You're talking three years later. What's the first thing that Muslims do? Salah. Yeah. First thing we do is salah. So this, this verse is actually speaking about prayer, salah. So read in the name of your Lord who created means recite in the name of your Lord who created. So this is revelation, right? This is Quran speaking about itself. So Allah revealed the, the Prophet is looking for answers his entire life. Now the answer comes to him. The answer doesn't mean go read mathematics. Doesn't mean go read a book. That's not the blinding answer that comes to his life. The answer is this is the kalam of Allah, the most important thing in the history of mankind. Allah is revealing his book to you, giving you a process of getting closer to him, giving you information about him, the final revelation. Read it. Read it in your prayers. How do you read the Quran? The default of reading the Quran is in the Salah. So the first thing after that, Jibreel taught the Prophet ﷺ is how to make wudu and then how to pray. From day one, the Prophet was praying. I mean, not day one, but from the beginning, he was making Salah. Before the warning came, before the public part came. 
So iqra really means iqra al Quran musalliyan or iqra al Quran fi salati. That's the meaning. Recite the words of your Lord in your prayer. There's so many proofs for that. Because that's what the Prophet's life was. That's what the next revelation was. Even if you look at the sequence of the Mus'haf, you have Surah Al Alaq. What's the next surah after that? Someone look it up. Surah Al Alaq, what's the next surah after that? Huh? Mudathir? No, no, in this Mus'haf, in the Quran. Al Qadr. What does Al Qadr say? The first, the Iqra means recite in the name of your Lord. The next surah, we have revealed it on the night of Qadr. What's it? The Quran. This whole sequence of surahs is te teaching about Quran. So this is about Quran. It's about recite. The most important prophet looking for answers to get closer to Allah, know his Lord. The answer is, how do you know your Lord? By worshiping, by praying to him, putting your head down and reciting his words. So that's what the that's what this really means. So, um, so then, what happens next? Okay, continue to read. Okay, um, so, so, Yarjifu Fuaduhu, his heart is racing, he's fearful. So he is incredibly fearful, so he doesn't know what's happening. Imagine experience like that. So, what does he do? He runs back to Khadija radiallahu anha, and he says to her, cover me up, cover me up. And then she covered him up until he settled down. So when you have a, like a, a shock and awe experience, you're in a state of shock. Adrenaline is flowing. So you can't really think. You need some moments to calm down. So you have like, you know, sweating, you're sweating, your heart is racing. In that state, you really can't talk to someone because they're not really there. Uh, so they need some moments. So he had to come back to his comfort. Who was his comfort? Khadija radiallahu anha. He asked her to cover him up. He covered, she covered him up. And it took some time for him to calm down. And then when he calmed down, some of the fear went away. Continue. فَقَالَ لِخَدِيجَةً Okay, so then he told her what happened, and he said, لَقَدْ خَشِيتُ عَلَى نَفْسِي I fear for myself. What do those words mean? Those words mean that they have the sense that I might be going crazy. I fear for my mind. I fear for myself. So he said those words, so he's being honest. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Continue. Okay, la yahzunka. That's what you have. Okay, so I have something different. Okay, faqalat Khadija. So it, it doesn't say faqalat lahu for me. And kalla wallahi ma yuhzik Allahu abada. So there's slight differences. Is there a footnote here? Can someone check on, on that line? So it does reference the difference? Okay. So, you know, it's, it's not a big difference. So, when he says those words, Khadija said something amazing back to her, to him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he said, I might be going mad. She said, Kalla. She said to him, never. So, look how firm she was, radiallahu anha. She was his comfort. She was the one who consoled him. She brought him back to his senses, uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And, but why did she say never? Wallahi ma yukhzik Allahu abadai. By Allah, your Lord will never forsake you. So this is something amazing for people of da'wah. If you want to know what a believer looks like, what are the qualities that make a person a strong and solid human being? What were the qualities of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu before he received Nubuwa? She describes him in a very beautiful way. La yukhzik Allahu abada or ma yukhzik Allahu abada. So, Let's read one by one. Read the first quality. Okay, that's not the, the first. Next one. Okay, stop. 
So she gives her answer, why your Lord will never forsake you. Number one, because you are a person that maintains family ties. So if you want the qualities of success, they're right here. These are the best description of our Prophet pre-prophethood is this. And this is the best description of what it means to be a good person, a person who's protected, yes. Is that what? Yeah, Lama Tawqeed, of course. La tasilu rahim. Innaka la tasilu rahim. So it's a emphatic. Verily, you are the one who surely maintains family ties. So the Prophet ﷺ is known for silatul rahim. That's a great quality. What's the second quality? Wa tahmilul kal. So tahmilul kal is hard to translate. Al kal is like a burden. Um, so what does the English say for some of you? No, I know, but English translation, tahmilul kal. Tahmil is to bear. Kal is like a hardship. What does it mean you bear a hardship? See, so help the poor. I don't know how they get that here. I mean, that's what the implication are. So my translation, like al-kal, like in the Quran, if you look up kal, la yaqadiru ala shayin wa huwa kallun ala mawlahu. He is a burden upon his master. She a burden upon... Kal is burden. So you carry burdens. So what it means, it means you bear the burdens of everyone. So that's much more profound and deep. You bear the burdens of everyone. That means someone's hungry in your neighborhood, you feel their hunger. Someone's going through problems, you feel their problem. Someone going through hardship, it's your pain. Their pain is your pain. This is incredible. It's a great quality for Muslims, for believers. So if you want to know how to be successful in society, this is where, what you need to do. Because you can't just bring revelation to people without having this groundwork done. That's why the messenger, he had these qualities, he was known for these qualities his entire life, and then Allah revealed the revelation and he was ready to bring it to the people. So you, you have to do the groundwork in the society. You have to be able to bear people's burdens. Help them out. That's the implications. Um, what's the next one? What taksibul ma'adum? How does the English translate that? That's also a tough one. No, that's the next one. That's taqrid daif. Taksibul ma'adum. Huh? Yeah. To, so this is an explanation, yeah, to give wealth to people who don't have it. But what is taksibul ma'adum? It's like, so ma'adum comes from what? Adam. Adam means the lack of something or having the have-nots. Best translation, ma'adum, the have-nots. What taksib, what is taksib? To, like, means to gather, right? So a literal translation, it works pretty well, for, gather for the have-nots. That means you fulfill the needs of the people who don't have. So he's the one who used to do that. Ibn Hajjah says beautifully, he says, you give people what they cannot find from anyone but you. So, taksibul ma'adum. So you're literally the one who, who helps or brings to the people who don't have. So that's something amazing. So another amazing quality, taksibul ma'adum. Um, what else? What? But taqrid daif, that's you entertain or host your guests well. That's another beautiful quality. Guests come to you, you're hospitable to your guests. And then, is there another one? What tu'inu ala nawa'i bil haq. Tu'inu from i'ana means to help. Nawa'i bil haq are the people who have rights due to them. So, what tu'inu ala nawa'i bil haq. So, Nawa'i bil Haq, here the explanations say, basically is disaster relief. That's basically what it is. Like all the explanation, if you look at it, that's my translation. It's basically people go through cataclysmic events and they need help. So, you restore the rights to them, like you bring the food to them, the shelter that they lost in the earthquake, and things like that. So, Khairun wa Shar, okay. What is the translation? One of the anybody's translations say the last one. Yeah, see, disaster relief. 
to assisting the calamity of, of, of afflicting ones. So that's the end of the qualities. There's some other narrations of this report that add, but that's the hadith, and you are the one that's truthful in your speech. And another quality was to adul to adil amana. You are the one who fulfills the rights and responsibilities, amana. So anyway, amazing description of what a a human being is supposed to be like. That deserves to be framed, memorized. And this is these this should be the topic of your khutbas and talks. And this is what we should aspire to. And then continue. Okay, stop here. Okay, Madhatara. Okay, good. So Khadija says, then after some time I took him to Waraqa ibn Nawfal. So she took him to um, her cousin, Waraqa ibn Nawfal. So what's amazing here is like Khadija knows what she can do and what she can't do. So what she can do, she already did. She brought his senses back. She gave comfort to him. She reminded him, your Lord will never forsake you. But now next, she doesn't have the skills and knowledge to know what's happening, but she knows where she can help, uh, who can help. So, you know, when she's able to provide the help, she does. When she can, then she takes him to someone else who can help. So that's something very, very important. In our times, people don't do this, but we need to do that. You know, do your best to help people. And if you can, then you bring them to someone else that can, right? So you have to know your limits and know uh, what you can and can't do. So her cousin, Warqa ibn Nawfal, he says, الْجَاهِلِيَةِ He has someone who adopted Christianity in childhood, uh, in his jahiliya, or no, in the period of jahiliya. وَكَانَ يَكْتُبُ الْكِتَابَ الْعِبْرَانِيَةِ He used to write in Hebrew. So he was someone who uh, was among those people who didn't like the idol worship that was happening in their society. So he escaped and went to the Levant, Sham, and there are a number of individuals that did that. And he found an authentic Christian faith. So he found, you know, people who were original Christians, and that was the closest to Tawheed at that time. So he began to even to the point of writing and learn Hebrew. Of course, originally he's Arabic. So he's someone they turned to. And she said, look, your nephew of yours, because she's a relative. He, he's a relative of Khadija from one angle. He's also a relative of the Prophet, so from another angle, because they share the same ancestors. So she said to him, you know, listen to your nephew. And he said, my nephew, what do you see? What's going on? Continue. <laughs> Okay, stop here. So he says, what, when he heard the Prophet describe what happened, he said, this is the Namus. So Namus is a strange word. Namus is related to like Jasus. So Namus is someone who comes in secret. And Jasu, so is kind of like a good person. It's a good meaning. So keeper of good secrets. Jasus is someone who's a keeper of evil secrets. He spies against people. So Namus is his way of referring to the angel. He says, Adhan Namus. This is the Namus that came to you, the same Namus that Allah revealed to Musa, the revelation. And he says, um, I wish I had the strength that I would be alive when your people 
um, drive you out? That's a strange answer. People will drive you out. And nothing's happening yet. He hasn't even, like, he doesn't even know what's going on. But Qala Rasulullah he said, Awa mukhrijiyahum. They're going to drive me out? So he said, Qala na'am. So continue, Qala na'am. Okay, stop here. So he said, yes, no individual ever came with what you came or was given what you are going to be given except that they were driven out. And if I ever see that day of yours, I will help you. Ansuruka nasran mu'azzara. I will help you the best way I can. Um, so he's, so that's the end of that story. Thumma lam yanshab warqat ibn antufiyas. Shortly thereafter, he passed away. Warqat ibn Nawfa. So wafatar al-wahi. And then revelation stopped for a period of time. Fatar al-wahi. Okay, so Iqra was the first revelation. Then it stopped for a while. So we don't know what that wow was. Um, and then Qala Abu, it says, Qala Ibn Shihab. So now Ibn Shihab is continuing adding some more details. So we'll stop here um, in 51. So the story comes finished, but there's half of the hadith left. So uh, next week we'll continue this hadith, finish it off, and then continue the others, inshallah. Any questions? Yes. Yeah, so, so the, the Arabs, so Shawudi Allah writes that the Mushrikeen, they were Abrahamic. That's something strange to understand, but they were Abrahamic in faith and origin, and they had lost the way and it added a lot of corruption, but at the base, they were Abrahamic. Their rituals were Abrahamic. Their basic, like some of the, the beliefs were Abrahamic, so all of them, or most of them believed in Allah as the main God. But then he had daughters and sons and angels, and they believed in the Hajj. They believed in Ibrahim as a great prophet. So it's it's what happened is it was a original faith that got corrupted, and there are remnants of the original faith left. So yeah, most of them still had a sense of Allah. Which one? Yeah, Hanafiya, yeah. Hanifa, yeah. So, I mean, the original, there is a group of people, the Hanifa. Hanif. Hanif is a description of Ibrahim's nature, which is turning, you know, away from everything in creation in favor of Allah. Um, so, so, even in this society, those who rejected the idols, they call themselves Hanif, and yet the Hanaf was one way of looking at it. So, um, and that goes back to an Abrahamic origin. That's pure, the pure ones. They just stick to Ibrahim and the main Allah, and reject all the idols and so on. So, yes, I don't think so. Um, parts of so the early revelation is narrated by many companions, like Iqra. But in this detail, like in these details with these words, no. Like, so Aisha is the best narrator of this because she's summarized in the best way. So there are pieces of this story that appear elsewhere, but they're all getting it from the same sword. Likely, they probably got it from Aisha also. So even if they narrate it, they probably learned it from her and she learned it from the Prophet. So that's, this is the primary account of this period in the best way from Aisha. Yeah. Oh, Allahu Alam, I, I don't know. But I know Ibn Hajar says this, and the scholars say that this is the best and most exhaustive account of this early revelation that comes from Aisha. Um, so, a good way, well, a good way would be to look at Sahih Muslim, the chapter that this would be in, and he would put all the different 
strong narrations there from different isnads, but his book is about fiqh, so this probably wouldn't be in that book, right? It's not a, it's not one of those hadith. So that's what makes Bukhari different, that he's giving the building blocks, he's not starting with salah, this is not a legal hadith, and so it's, and you won't find in Tirmidhi, that's entirely legal ahkam, so it's hard to find, like, these early details. You'll find in Ibn Hisham and Ibn Ishaq, Waqidi, the Sira books. So they'll have accounts, and Allah alam where those accounts go back to. It's just simple. If somebody can look up by next week, just this portion of the Sira in any of the Sira books, see where they're quoting. It'll be interesting. But they're, they're compiled prior to Imam al-Bukhari. So they have their own isnads, but ultimately, which companion they're going? That's a good question. We need to look that up. Any sister? And anyone online? Okay. Fatah Allah alaykum, inshallah. We have half, we're halfway through. Two more weeks left, inshallah. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik nashadu an la ilaha illa antna astaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.